the studio with me, I have a man who rides and he is uh, one of the first, to say you are one of the first, uh, what, what do they call it, Singularity University? I don't know what that means actually. I'm a faculty member of Singularity, faculty, um, Singularity University and I was the first African to chosen to represent Africa on the Singularity So let board. me properly introduce you, John Sane, thank you, thank author. You. When I was reading your book, so mm. foresight, when I was reading your book, first of all I began by saying, I want to box you, because in the media that's what we do. We yes. simply we check this, you know, huge amounts of information and you try to put it in a little box. So yes. I put you in a little box and I said, you're a futurist. Then I said, what does that mean? Then I kept on reading, then I thought, mm, you're, any, you're a philosopher. Right. Then, then I really got into the book. Right. But first things first, what motivated you to write this book? Well, I think we need to all become philosophers uh, to we a certain do. extent uh, because we need to understand the undercurrents behind what everything uh, is happening around us is always based on a certain level of mythology and philosophy. Yeah. The reason I wrote the book was because of a question I get pretty much after every keynote I deliver, yeah. no matter where in the world. And the question is, how do we prepare our children for the future? And what should they be doing for the future? Right. And the, my response is not so much what they should be studying, but how they should be behaving. Yeah. You see, the Industrial Revolution got us all to become fantastic linear thinkers. Yeah. And we needed to be in the process-driven linear world that the Industrial Revolution had. Right. We're moving into the quantum world, which yeah. requires us to be exponential thinkers and not linear thinkers. Yeah. So the book is helping people to change their behavior yeah. for the future so that they become naturally adaptive yeah. and flexible. Sum up for me, because if I try to sum up what you've written here, I think I would be lying or maybe I'll probably get a very, very, uh, give a very shallow uh, interpretation of what exactly it is that you capture in it. Because you say there are 20 shorts here that you are spreading out and I am thinking maybe what I should do is to focus on five because that's th those are the ones that I remember, right? Right, right, sure. So I think first and foremost, um, the book is about the perspective we hold about the future because the perspective that we hold about the future determines how we prepare for it. And so if we're fearful for the future, it doesn't allow us to prepare correctly. Right. So we can either choose, are we living our lives based on hindsight, yeah. meaning trying to repeat yesterday and trying to project it into the future, yeah. which really won't work. Are we living in plain sight, only taking in what our five senses tell us and not understanding what quantum science is proving to us? Yeah. Or are we living in insight, which I think is the most dangerous place to be, sure. otherwise called the expert problem, right. when you've been trained in something so diligently for so many years, yeah. any information that comes to you, and if it doesn't fit into those constructs, you can't yeah. accept it. Absolutely. And so what foresight is, is developing wisdom and curiosity as our motivating factors and the way we make decisions about the future. Yeah. And so foresight is how do we develop, cultivate wisdom yeah. and awaken our curiosity? Absolutely. So when I was reading it again, I was thinking, you know, I, I, I went to school a long time ago, but I was thinking, what's the best way of reading this book? Do you right. read it as an academic book or do you read it like you're reading a novel? What's the best way? Because you want to remember some of the things that you have here, but at the same time, you also want to come out with like a big idea of what you've been able to distill out of all these pages. Well, I think it's a great question. I have no idea. It depends how you like to read a book. <laughs> but what I decided to do, because we live in a world where our attention is almost like a goldfish these days, yeah. I decided to write 20 essays. And so I've written 20 essays okay. to get us ready for 2020 and beyond, developing a vision of 2020. Okay. So I've played on the 20 many different times. Uh, and 10 of the essays are focused on psychology and 10 of the essays are focused on the future. Mm. But you also talk about technologies. Yes, of course. Yes, and you say there are four that we ought to yes. be aware of. Yes. Go for it. So what has happened is that we are now at the end of the beginning. And what I uh, mean uh, by uh, that... Say that again. We are at the end of the beginning. Uh -huh. And what I mean by that is we are ending chapter one of the internet. We've been sure. with the internet for about 20 years now. Yes. And the, tw the internet has been very much about connecting humanity, which we've connected four billion now. We're about to connect the next three and a half billion. Yeah. And those internet has been pretty much focused on social and search. Right. Google and Facebook and Snap uh, Snapchat and Instagram and these things have really dominated the internet. As we enter phase two or chapter two of the internet, the internet will evolve to have four new pillars, mm -hmm. blockchain, artificial intelligence, data, and biotechnology. Sure. And these four pillars will change the internet and what the internet will mean to us and how yeah. we'll interact with it yeah. in an incredibly new way. In a positive way? Well, everything has a positive and negative. 
And for me, I'm an optimist. I always see the positive. Yeah. And I believe that the advent of free energy and free communication and free transportation yeah. is obviously beneficial to everybody around the world. Yeah. So, so I, caught, I, I looked at one aspect in particular that you, you, you cover in here, and this is around, this is Infotech. I think this is the page on Infotech, no, machine learning, on machine learning, where you say, and I'm, beginning, I'm quoting it right here, where you begin, our devices will be able to recommend that what we should eat how we should exercise, what to study, if we should study, what job to pursue, what to date, every aspect of our life will be informed by the application. And then you say in brackets, yes, this is a good thing. And I'm thinking, no, man, this is not a good thing. Let me ask you a question. Do you yes. use Google Maps? I do. Is it a good thing? It is a good thing. But it's already taking away some of your own personal decision-making process. So you wanted to go this way, but now you're just listening to the machine and saying, okay, let me just go this way because it knows better. But why does it know better? It knows better because it can tell you if there's a traffic jam coming. You can't. And so when you've already adopted Google Maps, what I'm saying there is these things will all be slightly adopted, yeah. slowly but surely, slowly but surely. Yeah. So when you first went on, did an aptitude test, yeah. that was telling you what you should study. Yeah. Before that, you chose yourself. Can, can, can I tell you my fear though? Okay, go ahead. My fear the, is that one day there will be a machine that will be able to, that I, or glasses like yours, that I put on my face and then I can read your mind. That well, scares me. Yeah, Does sure. it not scare you? Uh, well, let me ask you this. What is, is it co coming though? That's another side of the question. Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll get questions. to that. I'll That's get to that. But yeah, yeah. what's going on in your mind that you're scared of other people seeing it? Are you dodgy? <laughs> 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 no, but understand something. <laughs> the level of transparency and privacy yeah. are switching, are changing. So there is so much transparency, and especially with blockchain arriving now, everything will be transparent. And the second thing is that privacy is And is that a dead. good thing? Exactly. Well, where does privacy dead. go? No, but privacy is dead. Oh Privacy is finished. Okay. And so remember something. Just 20 years ago, you never knew what was going on in your neighbor's house. It was so private. Now we kind of are quite comfortable with the notion that everybody has issues. We all have insecurities. We're all part of this human race together. We don't have to act like we're perfect. So really what we've got to realize is that society is changing. The very essence of value is changing. It is. It is. And, and, but and this can't be positive, John, because think about it. If we go to elections and yes. these machines are able to read why or how we are going to vote, there might be no need for elections. Well, I don't think there will and be And therefore, for you read the machines and you read elections and you tell me where we're going to be. Well, I don't think we'll have the same paradigms as we're having right now. So you can't apply oh, this there technology. There will be no elections, you're saying. Well, I'm saying governments will change. With the advent of 5G, smart cities, and city-state governments, which will become the future, yeah. the way we see governmental institutions right now, yeah. I absolutely believe will change because we already realize When is this change, John? It's gradual and it's a process that happens. I don't know exactly when, but I would imagine over the next 10 or 15 years, we'll see fundamental shifts in our society yeah. and fundamental ways of us changing the way we act with power dynamics. One of the things that you, you cover is uh, uh, what is it? It's blockchain. Yes. And uh, you say blockchain is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And you also argue that uh, you know, it will change again the way we uh, transact. Transact. Yes. And I am thinking, when I think blockchain immediately, you say a lot of people don't understand. I don't understand it yes, either. Yes, many people don't. Absolutely, 100%. One of the things it covers is, of course, your cryptocurrencies. Yes. And I'm looking at Bitcoin. Yes. And I am thinking a future like that, undefined, undetermined, yes. unpredictable, yes. cannot be good. Well, that is the change in the society we're having right now. You see, we come from a society where religion and society told us what to believe, yeah. when to believe it, how yeah. to pray, how to suffer, and what the story was. We weren't allowed to question those things. Yeah. And I we like that little example you gave of a village in, in Sicily. Sicily. Yes, yes, yes. And so what happened is we all come, well, not us, but maybe you do and maybe a lot of our parents do, but you come from a society that was told that you had no freedom, but you had absolute certainty of your life. Today that's swapped. Yeah. We have incredible levels of freedom, but no certainty. And that is what the book is about, is that we are not going through a technological shift. Yeah. We are going through a societal shift. Yeah. The very essence of how we live and how we interact is changing. So, so, so John, you make your living by talking, by writing stuff like this, which is great. Uh, you, 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 you consult for governments as well. Yes. Have you talked to the South African government? Yes, I have. I've met Who? with Praveen Gordon. Okay. Yes. Uh, what I How talk did about you in find the book. Your insights, yeah. yeah, fantastic. I mean, he, he, he actually said it was a very inspirational afternoon. I had an hour with him, which became two and a half hours. And so we chatted for two and a half hours around yeah. the restructuring of how the uh, departments and the government should be rethinking the future. Right. And so what I share in the book is how the difference between innovation and disruption. Yeah. And so innovation is what you did yesterday, just a bit better. Disruption is making your current business model obsolete to create a new one. Sure. And so what they have to do in Eskom 
is they have to have a today team, yeah. a tomorrow team, and yeah. a day after team. Yeah. Because they all have very different focuses and different strategies. Sure. And so it's about developing new teams to focus on new business models and new outcomes. Well, while we have you, you might as well uh, give you the platform to give Cyril Ramaphosa a few free uh, ideas on how to fix I mean, we all know the, the extent of the problems in South Africa. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think I can do it in such a short period of time. <laughs> Firstly, I must just say I'm a huge Cyril Ramaphosa fan. I you think are. he's doing an incredible job in leading the country, not only from a political point of view, but as a very calm, centered human being. Right. And we have to take a lot of, um, uh, we must look into the human that's actually running the place, you know. Yeah. Um, in past, um, lots of presidents aren't centered human beings. Donald Trump being one of them is very erratic in his thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me is how do we divide the country into understanding people that need to focus on fixing the problems yeah. and people that need to focus on creating new solutions. Right. They can't be the same person. Well, when he dreamt, people said, you're a dreamer. Come back to reality. We are in this situation right now. Yes, but a CEO of an organization creates vision for the rest of us to follow. That's what his job is. He's not a COO. He's a CEO. And a COO is there to implement the vision and the dreams of the CEO. Yeah. Steve Jobs was a dreamer. He, he wasn't was. the doer. Yeah. So Ramaphosa is a dreamer and a visionary. And so we must jump on the bandwagon and add our value. Yeah. It's too easy to break people down. It's just too easy. Yeah. It's, an, uh, it's so easy. I mean, Julius Malema was just breaking him down. But that's his Precisely. job. That's what he continuously does. No, but his, his job could also be to help the president create a future that is re realizable. Isn't exactly. It? So why would you want to break something down instead yeah. of jumping on the bandwagon to do that? So I had a whole social media push to say, listen, guys, yeah. we've got a visionary now who's yeah. already been successful. Yeah. He doesn't want to take anybody's money. He's made his money. Yeah. Let's jump behind the bandwagon instead of trying to shoot holes into his speech. Yeah. Upset him. Actually, if I were him, what I would do is I would say to the government, tell you what, I am going to take a rand for my salary. My money, you take it and you go and remove all the, the shanties in uh, Alex or the, those other kind of places. But did he not give half his salary away already? Well, half. I think he Does has, he yeah. need the other half? He, he just he just give it away. Yeah, I, mean, I think but it's yeah, a sure. greater show of uh, yes. yeah, humanism. Anyway, I wanted to ask you, what's missing from his plan? Because you're a futurist, right? So what's missing from his plan when you look at what the, the vision that he, cre he crafted in that state of well, the Well, the reason I, am, I love him so much is because I understood that he's alignment to the future is perfect. I was really behind it because he's talking about putting this, oh, he's already done it, put the community together yeah. to get people ready for the fourth industrial revolution. Yep. And he's got that now yeah. sort of um, team that's focused on that and working on that. Yeah. But he, he, he's already moving towards, let's create new solutions and let's fix the old ones. Isn't it too slow though in terms of creating that future? Because uh, many people are saying South Africa needs to have something that it defines and the, def the future will be defined by technology. I w Shouldn't we be investing more resources more money, more everything into trying to make sure that South Africa becomes that country where if you talk technology, do you know what I mean? I watched the, the CEO of Pepsi when she was asked about what she thought about how Barack Obama was running America. And her answer was brilliant. And it's exactly the same answer I'm going to give you. She said, I run a board of a huge organization. Imagine half my board hated me and didn't want me to get anything through. How would I even run my business? <laughs> And so what Barack Obama had was the same issue. Now Cyril has the same issue. He has Julius and he has the DA all trying to create problems rather than create fluidity. Yeah. So is he slow? No. The system of democracy makes him slow. And that's why I'm saying there must be a new governmental situation being birthed so yeah. that we're not stuck in these ridiculous motions of debates that yeah. aren't really moving anybody forward, Absolutely. but actually measuring egos. Yeah. So he's not too slow. The system is too slow. And so what should have been a five-minute conversation became a 15-minute conversation. John, thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. That's uh, John Steiner. He's a trend specialist, author, and uh, entrepreneur.